Hello, everyone. My name is Sophia Sani. I am currently the Caribbean Policy Lead for Ocean Unite. We are a small group of experts working to catalyze ocean regeneration by engaging and activating audiences on the importance of oceans. It is both a pleasure and an honor to invite you all to today's webinar. The webinar will stimulate dialogue with experts in the region on the global standard for nature-based solutions, discussing opportunities and challenges for the Caribbean islands. The Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions is a timely initiative by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and provides clear parameters for defining nature-based solutions and a common framework to help benchmark progress. The IUCN resolution adopted at the 2016 World Conservation Congress defines nature-based solutions as actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well being and biodiversity benefits. As governments and countries work to identify ways to transition from our current battle with the COVID 19 pandemic into a post COVID, or perhaps more fittingly, a COVID 19 accounted for circumstance, nature based solutions offer possibilities to address the impacts of COVID as well as similar societal challenges such as climate change, biodiversity loss, and food security. More than ever, it is important that we invest in the potential of nature, in the globe's natural assets, as we collectively work to adopt a more sustainable path to our socioeconomic development. Investments in nature offer us the opportunity to ensure the continued health and well-being of both people and planet. I am delighted that we are joined by a panel of experts and leaders who are much more adept at speaking on this topic than I am. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bethel Aguilar Rojas, who is the IUCN Regional Director for Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean to make opening remarks. Dr. Aguilar brings with her more than 25 years of experience in conservation and sustainable development where she worked extensively on developing and applying environmental law and policy in collaboration with governments and civil society. Dr. Aguilar, a Costa Rican national, has authored multiple mu publications in the fields of environmental law and policy. It is my pleasure to give Dr. Aguilar the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning to all. Good afternoon or, or good night for people connected uh, from other regions. It is my honor to be part of the opening of this discussion and to see the large participation of so many friends. Allow me to start by thanking the Honorable Chair of the Council of Ministers for Environmental Sustainability of the uh, Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and the Honorable Dr. Pirnell Charles Jr., Minister of Environment and Climate Change of Jamaica. IUCN members, commission members, partners, panelists, ladies and gentlemen from the Caribbean islands and other countries for joining this virtual forum on the global standard for nature-based solutions and the opportunities for the Caribbean islands. This event has been possible thanks to the joint efforts of IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, its Commission on Ecosystem Management, the IUCN Caribbean Regional Committee of Members, in collaboration with the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. Thank you to all. Through this event, we continue to disseminate the IUCN Global Nature-Based Solution Standard, launched recently globally in July 2020. Nature-based solutions are grounded in over 20 years of IUCN work to develop approaches that benefit people and nature. The past decade showed the relevance and potential of nature-based solutions, including through IUCN members formally adopting the definition of the term in 2016, as our moderator already explained. But that gave us a strong mandate to continue to work in this field. For years, IUCN has led and promoted the concept of nature-based solutions, which are actions that protect, sustainably manage, and restore ecosystems that are either natural or modified. Today, many governments, organizations, and partners worldwide use this concept. While we are very proud of this, the challenge was that everyone interpret 
interpreted nature-based solutions differently. There was a need to actually measure nature-based solutions in concrete terms. Today, the world has an international standard as a guide to effectively address societal challenges while benefiting both people and nature. This tool comes at a time when the whole world is facing a devastating crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, which adds to the critical climate change impacts that we are increasingly facing in our regions. And of course, I mean, for example, we cannot deny here the impacts of uh, the recent hurricanes, um, Iota and Eta. Therefore, it is even more urgent and crucial to, to orient our efforts based on a common vision using shared tools and concepts. The nature-based solution standard will allow the public, private, academic, and civil society sectors to have a common framework to design, implement, and scale up sound policies, actions, and investment in a transparent manner. The nature-based solution is standard is an opportunity for all of us to tailor our actions to the need of human population and biodiversity. This forum motivates IUCN even more to support the insular Caribbean region and its transition to a sustainable blue and green economy, aiming at human ecosystem resilience. I look forward to hearing from today's panelists who will share how we can strengthen our efforts, deepen our partnerships, and create new friendships in the Caribbean region to leverage the power of nature through this global standard. Thank you and have a wonderful session. Gracias. Thank you, Dr. Aguilar. I think it makes the most sense that we do approach it from a common ambition using shared tools and concept more than ever. Um, I would like to introduce our next uh, speaker Coming from the organization, on behalf of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, I'd like to present Honorable Herod Stanislaus. He's the Minister of Physical Planning of St. Lucia and the Chair of the Seventh Council of Ministers for Environmental Sustainability. Honorable Stanislaus is a politician, parliamentarian, and a cabinet minister, and was appointed to this ministry in 2016. Honorable Stanislaus, it is a pleasure to have you. I give you the floor. Hi, good morning. I'm not Honorable Stanislaus. However, he's going to be here in 30 seconds. Could you please wait? Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. As we wait for the minister, I see everyone has been using the chat window. Thank you so much for introducing yourself. Let us, letting us know where you're coming from. Um, a reminder to all participants of the webinar, uh, should you have any questions, please type it into the Q&A window and not the chat window. Um, you are free to direct questions to panelists. Uh, my job is to ensure that I get those questions <laughs> and uh, uh, share it with the panelists. So please feel free to use the tools uh, of the webinar. I see that we have Honorable Stanislaus with us. Uh, as a reminder, Honorable Stanislaus is the minister within the Ministry of Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport, and Civil Avi Aviation uh, in the wonderful island of St. Lucia. Welcome, Minister. I pass the floor to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sonny, and good morning to everyone. My apologies for being a few minutes late. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning to be part of this um, webinar, very important webinar on the NBS. Uh, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the OECS, is viewed globally as a model for regional integration 
and continues to use this moving towards together approach as we seek to reduce our vulnerability to disaster and climate change impacts, and most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. Within the OECS governments, St. Lucia is no exception. There is increasing awareness of the need to pursue more nature-based solutions in the quest to enhance our resilience to climate-related hazards and health pandemics. Governments are also recognizing that not only do nature-based solutions provide environmental and economic benefits, but they also support civil society and community resilience. Yes, the Caribbean region is now facing profound challenges, but we also note great opportunities to grow and shift the paradigm of development into a greener recovery of our economies and societies based on the richness of the natural resources and the biodiversity that this region possesses. This NBS webinar, we trust, will outline a pertinent approach to overcome such challenges and facilitate taking advantage of any opportunities. The application of nature-based solutions, NBS, supported by the appropriate standards as identified by the International Union of Conservation of Nature, IUCN, a partner organization of OECS, will enable the OECS and by extension, the Caribbean region to transition to a more sustainable green blue economy. This will focus on human and ecosystem resilience to face critical societal challenges, including those related to food, health and water security, urban development, and degraded biodiversity. We commend the IUCN for developing this standard, which seeks to ensure the credibility of the application of the NBS approach, as well as its adoption for adaptive management purposes, so that its contributions can inspire other entities beyond the environment and conservation sectors. I wish all of you a productive and fruitful discussion as we seek to find better and more concrete avenues for the implementation of the nature-based solutions in favor of our environment, our economies, our people, and our region. I thank you very much. Minister, thank you so much for ending on such a positive note. Um, we, now, we now have a video we'd like to share with you. Um, in this video, uh, we have a statement uh, made by the IUCN Director General, Dr. Brunner Burrow, in his statement to the UN Summit on Biodiversity. So the summit just recently happened in September. He stresses the importance of stopping biodiversity loss to achieving sustainable development goals. We are very excited to share his words. Biodiversity is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history, causing fundamental harm to nature and people. IUCN draws urgent attention to the nature emergency while recognizing that it must be tackled in tandem with climate change. We can address this emergency through the post-2020 global biodiversity framework with targets that add up from local to national to global levels. Together, we must halt the loss of biodiversity by 2030 and strive through restoration for net gain by 2050. The framework must be for everyone. The Rio and biodiversity related conventions, all governments, the private sector, indigenous people, local communities, and all of civil society. It must clearly link to the 2030 agenda and communicate how biodiversity conservation is critical to sustainable development. A crucial ally is nature itself. We must use 
nature-based solutions, which benefit nature and people by protecting, sustainably managing, and restoring ecosystems. Fundamental to these are standards, such as the IUCN Global Standard for Nature-Based Solutions, which ensure that these solutions are truly effective and qualifiable. As we tackle the nature emergency together, the economy is key. We must stop investing in activities that deplete nature, and we must abolish incentives to exploit and degrade nature. Operations in sectors that can negatively affect biodiversity, including extractives, agriculture, infrastructure, forestry and fisheries, must change and contribute to biodiversity. Governments are beginning to insist that companies disclose their impacts on biodiversity and the finance sector is recognizing the risk to the economy posed by the biodiversity loss and starting to charge for loans contributing to it. Investment is necessary and must leverage the achievement of biodiversity targets while generating economic benefits and conserving biodiversity. In this way, we can redirect efforts towards building economies that sustain and regenerate nature. We look forward to discuss this idea further at the IUCN World Conservation Congress in Marseille, where the post-2020 global biodiversity framework will be high on the agenda. Here to present on nature-based solutions, looking at concept definition to global standard, really getting into the nitty gritty of how the process came about in developing the, the global standards for nature-based solutions is Dr. Emmanuel Cohen Shasham. Dr. Shasham is a consultant, researcher, and group lead in the natures of nature conservation, environmental science, and policy. She has over 19 years of experience in diverse frameworks and currently is leading the nature-based solution thematic group within the IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management. She has contributed to developing the IUCN work on nature-based solutions since 2014 and is the lead author of the IUCN CEM publication, Nature-Based Solutions to Address Global Societal Challenges. And one of the 2019 papers on the IUCN core principles for nature-based solutions. She was also closely involved in the development of the global standard on nature-based solutions. And so is a perfect person to present this to us. Dr. Cohen, I invite you to start your presentation. You have the floor. Thank you. I'm trying to, to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can, can see it now. Me? Can you see it? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your screen. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me today to join this uh, very important webinar. I'm happy to share with you uh, the work that IUCN and the IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management has done on nature-based solutions or NBS in the past few years. I will start by presenting the definition of, and the conceptual framework that has served as the basis for the global standard, uh, providing you with a, a small um, timeline on the evolution of nature-based solutions first, uh, then emphasizing the work on the NBS principles that we've done, then referring to some examples, and finally presenting shortly, very shortly, the global standard on nature-based solutions. So I'd like to first provide you with a brief overview of the development of the NBS concept and the NBS work. A lot of the knowledge uh, and the experience that has helped to develop the NBS uh, framework and work comes from earlier work, such as the work on the ecosystem uh, approach, which is the foundation for, for, for nature-based solutions um, by, by the Convention on Biological Diversity. The, the work on ecosystem-based uh, adaptation, ecosystem-based mitigation, ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction, the work on natural solutions, the work on ecosystem services and so forth. 
Uh, but I would say that specifically with regards to NBS, um, the, it's only in the past six years, I would say, that uh, NBS has been really defined and developed uh, as, uh, as a concept. Uh, there has been a huge surge, and here are just a few examples uh, of interest and of use and development of uh, the NBS, both in, in policy and at national levels for, for a few countries, and in international policy with the increasing reference to NBS in several international conventions, documents, and events. NBS are also uh, increasingly referenced uh, to having this huge potential, as it has been already mentioned with the, by the previous speaker, to address societal challenges such, uh, such as biodiversity loss, uh, climate change, and so on. There is an increase in, in a huge increase in, in research and publications, both uh, gray and white publications, and in practice. And then within IUCN, and this is the focus of my presentation, um, I would say that there has been a few important milestones to the development of uh, nature-based solutions. So first of all, after the, the World Conservation Congress, or WCC, in 2012, um, uh, and nature-based solution became one of the three areas of the IUCN global program and uh, strong collaboration resulted uh, within IUCN to develop further the um, NBS to develop the definition principles and, and the framework. Then at the WCC of 2016, uh, we had both the publication in Hawaii, we had both the publication of um, nature-based solutions to address global societal challenges, which I will present and which is defining what NBS are, providing some examples, providing in detail uh, what we mean by the different principles. And a uh, very important milestone is the resolution that was adopted by the IUCN uh, community and which defined for the first time what NBS are. Uh, in this resolution, we also had, um, it called for the finalization of parameters and guidelines. And afterwards, in the 2017-2020 IUCN work program, uh, which also had NBS as, as a third of its, uh, of its program, um, the, the, the program uh, um, called for an urgent need for the development of an operational framework, including standards to implement and to assess uh, nature-based solution. And this is how we, we, we proceeded with the development of the NBS standards. So then the next step was to uh, further develop the, the conceptual framework with the principles and finalize and develop and finalize the global standard uh, that will be presented. So according to, um, to the resolution, what, what are nature-based solutions? So nature-based solutions are uh, actions to protect, manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems to address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. And by these major societal challenges, what we mean is climate change, uh, natural disaster, social and economic development, uh, human health, food security, water security, ecosystem de uh, degradation, and biodiversity loss. But one, one thing that is imperative is really for NBS to provide both to address societal challenges but to ensure that they, they result both in benefits for human uh, and, for by the, and, and for nature together. Um, in addition to the NBS definition, the, as I mentioned, the 2016 uh, resolution mentioned um, a set of eight principles that to help define better what NBS are. I'll just mention a few here. Um, the first one on embracing nature conservation NBS is not there to replace nature conservation, but it's more or conserve a certain uh, uh, species uh, or ecosystem for their own sake, but it's really more to uh, embrace and to complement nature conservation. Uh, another one is, for instance, the principle uh, number two on uh, the fact that NBS can be complemented with other types of uh, societal challenges. So these are we are, we are looking for synergies with different types of uh, solutions when it's necessary. For instance, uh, mixing mangrove restoration with the construction of a seawall for coastal resi uh, resilience and to address storms and floodings, for instance. 
or the principle number eight on in, in having NBS, making sure that NBS are integral part of the overall design of, uh, uh, of um, an intervention. So ensuring that we're upscaling NBS and that it's in integrated in policy and actions and in, in leg legislations and so on. Here, very briefly, I want to show you an uh, hypothetical scenario where we have a protected area that is close to a watershed. There is a uh, mangrove, there are forests around the watershed, there are uh, small communities. Um, and then with time, uh, there is a wetland here. And, and with time, with, because of a climate change and a surge in, um, in, in storm, there is a degradation of the entire watershed and, and the, the natural ecosystem with the degradation of the forest and a city here that has been developed cannot, cannot more uh, absorb the, the, the flooding. So in this case, for instance, the NBS here um, represents um, different types of concepts, uh, such as forest landscapes res restoration or wetland restoration here, or green infrastructure within the, the city or mangrove restoration here. And, and as you can see, there is a synergy with the constructed wall as well to, to, to help uh, prevent flooding. And the protected area that was here next to the watershed and which was aiming more at preserving a certain species now plays a, a central role in helping to, 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 to implement and to um, uh, outscaling the, the NBS intervention. So I won't go into detail at all. I just want to mention that if you're interested in looking at different case studies, uh, we have a list of 10 different case studies in completely different contexts in the world. Uh, that are illustrating what NBS are in for addressing different types of so societal challenges in different contexts and uh, to um, uh, address uh, in, in geogra geographical context and um, uh, using different types of uh, uh, nature-based solutions. So to better understand the NBS framework and the relations uh, relationship between NBS and the other types of uh, of um, approaches, we found it useful to consider the NBS as an umbrella type concept uh, of different concepts that were already well established, all, all type of concepts that are ecosystem-based or ecosystem-related approaches, and uh, that are all part of this umbrella type of concept. And we found it useful also to divide these concepts into five different categories, so restoration, uh, types concept, management type concept, infrastructure type of concept, issue specific like ecosystem uh, EBA or ecosystem-based mitigation, ecosystem-based uh, uh, DRR and protection concept. Uh, to complete the first definitional framework, and I'm, 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 I'm putting emphasis on this because that was really the, the basis to develop the, the standard afterwards. Uh, what we wanted to ensure is that, that uh, NBS was really appropriate as an umbrella uh, concept for those different types of concepts and that there wasn't any gap in the, uh, the definition and in the principles that we had set in the, the resolution. And what we found out is, first of all, that uh, NBS serves well as an NBS, uh, as an, an umbrella for different types of concepts we compared the eight principles of NBS here to principles in other types of um, published approaches that are, that are related to NBS. And we found out that there are three principles that really stand out. The one on synergy, complementarity with other types of solution. The one on ensuring that the NBS is implemented or designed and taking into account the broader uh, landscape. And the last one on policy integration, as I said, to upscale and to ensure that it's that NBS are taking into account in policy and legislation and so on. And then we also found out that there are uh, specific terms that were missing and that or that were uh, not sufficiently emphasized in the NBS principles. And we, we really had to take into account these uh, before developing the standard. And these are adap uh, adaptive management and governance, the effectiveness of the solution, the uncertainties that are related to the, the implementation of the plan or the planning of NBS, uh, the multi-stakeholder participation to ensure that different types of stakeholders are, are taking into account in the design and the implementation and the temporal scale and long-term uh, stability. So here, I just want to show you that it's, uh, it was important for us to, again, to, um, to uh, identify those gaps and to, to understand better the principles 
because they were the foundation to the global standard. So these are the, this is the resolution with the definition and principles. And as you can see, they're all basis to the different, to the eight different criteria uh, that are um, the criteria for the global standard for nature-based solutions. So the purpose of uh, the nature-based solutions uh, standard, global standard, is to set the common basis of understanding for uh, NBS and to provide a robust uh, framework um, to design, to implement, to assess, to adapt and to improve nature-based solutions. And this is in order both to contribute to transformational changes by improving NBS intervention to address societal challenges or by using, for instance, the feedback that is coming from people that are using the standard uh, to ensure that we're improving the uh, future revisions of the standard and also to support uh, uh, NBS related policy, both through the clarification and the development of those NBS um, uh, intervention. And the standard is uh, aimed at uh, um, being used by anyone that is working on the, the verification, the design and the scaling up of NBS. So project managers, landscape planners, development practitioners, conservationists, policy makers, finance sectors, both donors and investors, governments and planners. So it's really like a broad, broad set of uh, criteria that are and, 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 and we're targeting a large uh, and diverse uh, uh, audience to use, the, um, to use the standard. This figure is just to show you how those eight criteria, um, the eight criteria that that are uh, establishing the, the NBS global standard are interrelated, uh, interconnected. So there is the first criteria on societal challenges and to ensure that we're addressing societal challenges effectively. Um, then the one on designing at scale, as I said, taking into account the broader scale. Uh, the third one that is on ensuring that there is biodiversity net gain um, and ecosystem integrity when, when designing and implementing the NBS standard. Uh, the fact that NBS should be eco economically uh, feasible and, and viable. Uh, the fact that we have to uh, include, to have an uh, inclusive, tra transparent and, and empowering uh, governance process within the NBS. Uh, ensuring that uh, NBS are managed adaptively and based on evidence and that uh, they're sustainable um, and mainstream with an appropriate jurisdictional context. As I said, this is about this mainstream, the one that was uh, referring to in the last principle as well. So what we have at the moment, we have three types of documents, I would say, three types of products. We have the, the NBS standard, which is described very uh, in generally how the standard is with those eight criteria and the different uh, 28 indicators. Then we have the guidance documents that is explaining better what we mean by each of those criteria uh, and, the, and the indicators, how to implement it in detail, uh, how to use the self-assessment. And both of these documents, you can find it on, on the, the IUCN uh, website on each of the solutions. And then the last part is the self-assessment, which is a work um, in, in progress now. It's a, it's a, there is a draft, draft self-assessment that I'll very briefly present. And that is helping the person that is of people that are um, implementing or planning a, an NBS on how to self-assess their uh, intervention. So I will just go very fast through the, the eight criteria. Again, uh, the one on the first one on uh, global societal challenges uh, is to ensure that um, we're taking into account that, that the NBS, uh, NBS framework is taking into account uh, or targeting societal challenges. Um, and these are the, the six, six, seven societal challenges that I've mentioned earlier um, to ensure that it's really targeting, targeting societal uh, 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 challenges that are affecting a society. Um, that it's important that uh, all the different stakeholders are, are uh, aware of the challenges, that there is a, an agreement on what are the challenges to target and so on. The second one is again on designing, ensuring that when we design the NBS uh, um, uh, intervention, um, we were taking into account the broader landscape, whether it's uh, 
uh, and, and the, the interactions to the different sectors around it, uh, to the economy, to society, to ecosystems, and so on. Um, and make, making sure also that um, we are complementing uh, the MBS uh, framework to, or we are creating synergies with other, um, other types of solution when it's necessary. The third one is to ensure that uh, each NBS is really um, um, uh, resulting in net biodiversity gain and in, uh, ecosystem integrity uh, by the use of monitoring uh, or a clear and measurable uh, biodiversity conservation outcomes uh, and so forth. I'm just running because I don't have much time. Then the fourth one is on uh, ensuring that NBS are economically viable, so uh, that the direct and indirect benefits of and cost associated to the NBS uh, are identified and documented, that the effectiveness of NBS design is justified uh, and, it, uh, and is taking into account any associated externalities, um, that NBS design considers a portfolio of resourcing uh, options. Um, then the fifth, five, one, fifth, fifth criteria is about uh, the fact that NBS are based on, inclusing, on inclusive, transparent and empowering, empowering governance processes. So we have to make sure that there is a grievance uh, feedback and grievance uh, resolution uh, mechanism uh, in place or that is defined, that there is uh, mutual respect and equality uh, on the different stakeholders that are involved, um, that the stakeholders have been uh, identified and involved in all the process, both those that are infecting or that are going to implement the NBS and those that will be affected. Um, that the decision make, making, making process will respond to the rights and interest of uh, of all the affected stakeholders uh, and so on. Then the sixth criteria is about uh, ensuring that um, um, NBS is equitably uh, balancing trade-offs between the achievements of primary goals and the continued provision of multiple benefits. So meaning that um, uh, assessing and managing trade-offs uh, um, around uh, both soci social and ecological outcomes are crucial to planning uh, and to implementing nature-based solutions intervention. Then the last two ones are, uh, the seven ones is about uh, adaptive management, uh, as I said already earlier, through uh, uh, ensuring that there is a strategy that is established and that is used and there is regular monitoring, that is monitoring and evolution throughout the process of the DNBS, that there is an iterative learning process that I said that is an enabling uh, adaptive management. And the last one is on sustainable and mainstreaming. Um, and again, this is more the, the upscaling part uh, of uh, NBS to ensure that this, um, uh, to ensure that is in, in, um, triggering transformative change, that it's facilitating policy and regulate, uh, regulation framework and so on. So we can use the standard to design, to scale up, and to verify, as I said, uh, nature-based solutions intervention. For this, there will be uh, a lot of information that will be gathered. There will be a process of uh, stakeholders consultation. And then there is, um, uh, there is a self-indication, uh, self-assessment tool that we can use to uh, both assess to, uh, and, and to help uh, improve, to, to, to assess your, to, to plan, to assess your uh, intervention, and then to, to, to help improve uh, uh, the intervention. So I'll just very, very briefly touch on this. Uh, there is a, a group of uh, a few experts that, uh, that has uh, developed this scale, this rather um, easy scale on how to self-assess your, your uh, NBS intervention from insufficient, partial, adequate to, uh, to, to strong, so four different levels. And then for, um, if, if you look into the, the self-assessment, uh, for each of, the, each of the criteria, you have those indicators. So here you have a description of the indicator with an explanation, further explanation on the criteria. And then for each of those four levels, you have uh, um, some, some more in information on, on how to self-assess as, self -assess yourself. And the idea is uh, to ensure that um, you have it, um, that, your, that, that the, the, each of the criteria is, um, each of the, the eight criteria of the standard is in adherence to, uh, to the IUCN standard. 
And the most important part, I would say, uh, when you're when you're filling in the the, the self assessment and 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 this, if you're interested in in getting the the, the draft um, format of this self assessment, you can you can please register here or, or contact me. I'll help uh, help to you uh, for the documents. But for each of the criteria, it's really important that you at least have a partial level of criteria for each of those eight criteria, meaning that uh, even if you have seven criteria that do uh, do uh, that are that are sufficient, uh, if you have one that is ins insufficient, then it doesn't uh, adhere to the the NBS standard. So last, my, this is my last uh, slide on the governance the overall governance structure of uh, the global standard. There is an international standard committee that is responsible of the oversight and the safeguarding and the revisions, as I said, of future versions of the, the, the NBS standards. Then there is a science and knowledge committee that is responsible more of the, of the overall uh, scientific oversight of standards of uh, developing uh, and, and further exploring research priority based on the feedback that we'll get from the users that are uh, implementing um, the standard. And there is the, the user group, of course, with different types of stakeholders. Um, and this is more like the community of practice. And then the last part is the national and regional hubs with technical expertise, capacity building. Uh, and I suppose that several of you already uh, are aware or are in contact with, um, uh, with those uh, national and regional hubs. So I won't go into this, but uh, I'll just, just, just to finish, thank you very much. And if you would like to uh, get any of the reference, then you can go in the, the IUCN website on the, the CM website on HBA Solutions or the IUCN website on HBA Solutions. I'm sorry, I had to run. Dr. Cohen, thank you so much. Your presentation was incredibly comprehensive and I'm sure it helped to provide a greater understanding of how IUCN approached developing the standard accounting for these eight important criteria that you just went through. Um, we thank you for your work and I'm sure it's uh, everyone in the call uh, that's participating today found it very impressive. I'd like to remind you all that if you'd like to learn more about Dr. Hohen's uh, presentation, uh, please go to the IUCN website, all the presentations and videos from today's web webinar will be uploaded to the IUCN website. Um, following the webinar, there will be a notification that will be sent out to everyone that participated today. Um, and it will direct you to exactly where on the website you can find that information. Um, again, we have this really nifty Q&A tool. So if you have any questions that you'd like to direct to uh, any of the panelists or presenters, please ensure to use the question and answer tool. Um, we will be uh, uh, referencing this tool to ask questions to our presenters. So moving forward, how do we then take, uh, apply the standard, uh, use the standard um, in the region and presenting on this in a whopping five minutes, challenging five minutes, uh, we are inviting Dr. Hyacinth Armstrong Vaughn. Uh, she has a master's in environmental policy and currently holds the position of protected areas officer for the IUCN regional office of Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. Ms. Armstrong is a national of Trinidad and Tobago and has worked in the conservation field for over 10 years. She has immense experience working in design and implementation management, monitoring evaluation of uh, marine environmental and climate change educational products uh, in several organizations and across several institutions in the Caribbean. She is currently coordinating the Caribbean component of the IUCN BioPalma program. We are very excited to have her join us and I pass the floor over to her. Thank you, uh, Sophia. Um, let me just to presentation here. So good morning, everyone. Good morning, distinguished panelists and colleagues. As Sophia indicated, my role today is to share a brief example of the potential application of the nature-based solution standard that was just presented. 
The IUCN Global Ecosystem Management Program is working with the British Virgin Island government to implement the three-year project funded by the Darwin Initiative titled Post-Disaster Restoration of Mangroves in the British Virgin Islands. We are all very well aware of how vulnerable our small island development states are to the effects of climate change, natural disasters, environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. And this was expressed by Honorable Minister Stanislaus in his remarks. And the British Virgin Islands are no exception as evidenced in this map showing the hurricane track that hit the territory over the last 100 years, the territories within the space. And like many of our nations and territories, it suffered devastation at the hands of several of these hurricanes, but most recently hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017. The mangrove ecosystems on the territory, which provide services such as hurricane shelter, ecotourism, education, and nurseries to support local fisheries were decimated. And it's evident here in these two images on the left, um, taken at the Tortola Airport, International Airport in 2014, we're seeing healthy stands of mangroves in these three areas. After the passage of hurricanes in 2017, you can see the clear difference, no mangroves present, unfortunately. So to assist the government of the British Virgin Islands with its recovery and planning efforts, IUCN is producing a territory-wide map of mangrove ecosystems pre and post Irma to inform the identification of key pilot sites for restoration. And through this restoration effort, hopefully this nature-based solution invests in regaining the ecosystem services decimated by hurricanes Irma and Maria. And through the disaster risk reduction approach, the project aims to encourage mangrove restoration and conservation actions. So to give an example of how the NBS standard applies to this example, the restoration of mangroves on the southeast sector of Anagata Island would result in the net gain of biodiversity and ecosystem integrity, which is criterion three, because these mangroves, which are or were primarily in this area, are protecting salt ponds and their associated flora and fauna. And the salt ponds are in this general area here. In addition to overall restoration of mangroves on the British Virgin Islands continues to be a collaborative effort involving local communities and civil society organizations, as these stakeholders are direct beneficiaries of the ecosystem services that the mangroves provide. This is a good example of criterion five, which is aiming to identify or address, I should say, the inclusive, transparent, and empowering governance processes. Here you can see that uh, within this year, the National Parks Trust of the BB BVI, in conjunction with the local communities, started cleaning up and trying to restore the destroyed mangroves within the area. And of course, building on this, um, working to ensure that younger generations are aware of the value of restoring and the need, to cons the need for conservation of these areas um, towards the overall sustenance of life in the British Virgin Islands. So with this brief uh, presentation, um, while this project did not benefit from the actual application of the standard in its design, it clearly reflects elements of the standard that if applied can help guide future actions and decisions. And that's hopefully where the application of the framework as we start to present and utilize it within the region can hopefully benefit us because there are many initiatives such as this taking place 
which would um, which reflect the NBS standard and which can be, I think, fully applicable to the framework. Thank you. Hi, Sam, thank you so much. Um, most importantly, for sticking to the time. That was quite impressive. <laughs> um, also impressive, I think, was the use of this example in the BVI um, on how to illustrate uh, the use of the standard. I'm sure um, within the Caribbean, there are lots of uh, many other examples. And so, um, like I said, to everyone in the particip uh, that's participating today, uh, additional information can be found on the IUCN website. I encourage you to all uh, go to website and uh, download the information, take a read. Uh, following today's webinar, we will be sharing the presentations and the videos um, uh, following, following this webinar. So thank you very much, Hyacinth. And we now get to the part where uh, you can ask questions to our two fantastic uh, presenters. Um, I will read the questions. I know some of you have entered questions in the Q&A box. Thank you so much. Um, I see that we've started to answer some of those questions. Um, so I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Cohen to uh, come back on the webinar. Um, there are a couple of questions and I think we have about 10 minutes or so uh, for questions and answers. So uh, Dr. Cohen, there are a couple of questions that we have here for you. Um, the first, uh, a participant asks, shouldn't nature-based solutions include more explicitly climate change? Uh, second question, could you please explain why gender, equ gender equality sorry, is not specifically mentioned under indicator one? So I'll repeat. Could you please explain why gender equality is not specifically mentioned under indicator one? Dr. Cohen. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Um... I, I'm not sure if it's uh, in the criteria, if it's mentioned specifically in criterion one, I suppose no, because it's the criterion one is more about uh, societal challenges. And I wouldn't say, because um, from this question, I feel that uh, uh, like this is something capital that should be, uh, if I understand correctly the question, um, that should be uh, incorporated already in the first criteria. But in, in my understanding, there is no, uh, no order of preference or importance in the eight criteria. The fact that it's number eight or, or one, they're all equally important. So this is one, one point to make. Uh, and I'm just looking at the text, um, but uh, actually, yes, in criteria number five, there is um, one, indicated that is specifically referring to this. So the criteria number five is about NBS that are based on inclusive, transparent and empowering governance processes. And the indicator number two in, in criteria five is uh, specifically mentioning actually gender. So participation is based on mutual respect and equality, uh, regardless of gender, of age, of social uh, statue, uh, and upholds the rights uh, of indigenous people to free prayer and informed consent. Uh, so I think that, that it is covered. It's really important uh, to keep in mind that all of these eight criteria, as I mentioned in the beginning, are really interrelated. They're, they're, they're uh, interconnected and they need to be uh, seen as uh, in a comprehensive way or in, in an integrated way. So not, not separately, separately to to each other. The different criteria depend on each other also and are, are connected to each other. And then you you mentioned another point on climate change, correct? Yes, uh, the question referred to why doesn't it include more explicitly climate change? But I do believe this, this question came uh, towards the start of your presentation. Yeah, no problem. Um, well, actually, if you look, um, if you look in the documents, you know, especially the guidance on, on how to implement the standard, you will see there, there is one uh, big piece that is specifically mentioning uh, how uh, relevant the standard is on, HIV, on uh, climate change, sorry, and how, how important it is uh, both to address um, uh, the, the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis specifically. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, there are seven, seven uh, there is a list of seven societal challenges, global societal challenges that, and <laughs> that NBS are specifically um, addressing or targeting 
and and the first one is I mean one of the the the, the most important ones are climate so so through uh, climate uh, adaptation and through climate mitigation processes. Right. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. I know we have a third question, but it looks like um, there was a response uh, uh, by another representative from IUCN, but I think we do have some time uh, to discuss this a little bit. So I will pose a question to you, Dr. Cohen, and we can potentially use the rest of the time to address that question. So it's quite a long one. Um, so a participant asked, should we shift from sustainable development towards regenerative development? and support a decade of transformational changes contributing to both planetary boundaries and human rights, a green decade, which also should include changes in our national, local and corporate accounting systems to include those uh, forgotten capitals as a necessary framework for nature-based solutions. I'm happy to repeat. <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> uh, so uh, shouldn't we shift from sustainable development towards regenerative development and support a decade of transformational changes? And should these include changes to our national, local and corporate accounting systems as a necessary framework for nature based solutions? I don't know if I can answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer all the parts of this question, and and I invite any of the other uh, panelists maybe to to reply to to respond if you have uh, better inputs. What I can say is, um, um, as I said, one of the the, the things that the the the, um, the NBS standard is uh, really trying to reach is or is is really trying to. Uh, target is um, is um, achieving transformational uh, changes uh, throughout the NBS uh, process. Um, we're learning by doing. We're learning from practitioners, uh, from from the users that will be that are that will be uh, implementing um, the nature-based solution standard, and we want to understand that we want to get as much feedback as possible from from the from the user group. In order to implement to to improve the standard uh, and to um, and more specifically um, a target or or uh, how they say trained or for, for instance through, uh, both both through research and both through capacity capacity building uh, through the the um, uh, the uh, national and the, the regional offices to to try and respond to the, the, the real needs uh, of, of the users. Uh, so I think that, uh, well, again, it's, it's a process, it's a, um, it's a, how would I say, a process that is, it, it is in process, it's a work in, in progress, um, but, but this is really something that, that we want to, that we, we do want to achieve. So I hope it, help, it helps answer this question partially. And really I invite any of the other uh, panelists, maybe yes, since you have. Yep. I think we have um, the, the response also mentions uh, that criterion three and six uh, touch upon both natural capital and human capital and provides a link to uh, some additional information on that. Um, we have one more question that we'll ask in this session and this question is for Hyacinth and this is specifically referencing your work in the BVI. Uh, so a participant asks for the restoration project in the BVI are you taking advantage of climate finance or otherwise receiving funding for ecosystem services? Hyacinth. Thank you, Sophia. Um, I am actually not in a position to answer that question. I would like to defer that to one of my colleagues if she's able to um, have her microphone unmuted, Pia, Maria Pia Hernandez. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, I can I can take the question gladly, if I may. Yes, yeah. yes. of course. Go ahead, Pierre. <laughs> yes, um, this is a very good question because it points out an enormous possibility of LIAS and, and leverage with other initiatives. For this project in particular, I have to say that this is a very um, small financial initiative. Uh, it has been founded by the Darwin um, Initiative, um, an English um, um, organization, and we are initiating this. 
So at this moment, in this first phase of the project, it was more about reconstructing and rebuilding the ecosystem that was damaged by both hurricanes. But the idea is to, to uh, channel this experience and catalyze and, and, and do leverage with the results that we are having so far. So um, exploring financial possibilities is one of the avenues that we are also working on, but not in this first phase, which has been more focused on uh, rebuilding the infrastructure that was um, destroyed by the, uh, by, the, by the hurricanes. But we are working on it. We're working in alliance with the government as well and academia. So that's, for me, will be um, the next step for a potential second phase of the project. Uh, I don't know if I um, clarify. Thank you, thank you, thank thank you, Pia. Um, I see that my colleague from the BVI, Joseph Smith Abbott, has just shared on the chat. Uh, just reminding uh, colleagues that the BVI does not benefit from many of the pools of financial resources for implementation, um, given their territorial status. So, thank you so much for contributing uh, that answer, um, Joseph. I also see that you said there are technical and other types of barriers for access. Um, so I'd like to thank both Dr. Cohen and Hyacinth for your presentations today. Um, it definitely generated good dialogue and I'm sure that we'll have uh, some additional questions following the session. Um, we are now transitioning to the uh, very final part of our webinar. And I'd like to invite our four fantastic panelists to join me. Um, we have Mrs. Joan Norvell, Honorable Pernell Charles Jr. Mr. Jabanex Batista and Mrs. Carolyn Trebetskoy. These panelists will work on a uh, dialogue around a, uh, one of the key questions that we have tasked them with. And I'll read out the questions. Before they uh, respond to the question, I will give an introduction. So the question is, what opportunities does the standard for nature-based solutions provide for your actions and decisions to face the present challenges and needs of a paradigm shift towards social and economic development of the Caribbean islands? It's a very, very big question. Um, and I would like to first introduce Mrs. Norville, Joan Nor Norville, uh, to respond to the question. Mrs. Norville has been active in the field of environmental management for over four decades. She is currently employed by the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Commission uh, starting in 2009 and holds the position of Program Director, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Management. She also has oversight for the Land and Water Resources Program within the Environmental Sustainable Division at the Commission. Mrs. Norville, I now give you the floor uh, to respond. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. I would like to first start by saying thanks for the excellent presentations so far and very interesting. Um, in terms of the OACS member states, in trying to answer the question, I'll just give some Fast facts, for example, so the OECS member states are 11 countries, including the over British Overseas Territories and the French departments of Guadeloupe and Martinique, and they're approximately 1 million population. The objective of the OECS is to promote cooperation and economic integration among member states. And the, within the OECS commission, we have the Environmental Sustainability Division whose mandate is to assist member states in the sustainable use of natural resources to improve livelihoods and quality of life. Hyacinth mentioned the region is vulnerable and she showed some of the tracks. And we also note that as SIDS, we have limited financial resources, but within the Caribbean, we are rich in biodiversity, which is the foundation for social and economic resilience. The OECS also promotes the island systems approach because with the countries, they are so small that the distance between the ridge or the mountain top and the beach or the sea or the EEZ is very small. So whatever happens upstream or on land will also affect 
our marine resources. In the OECS, we generally promote environmental projects as a blend of gray or hard infrastructure and green ecosystem-based or eco-DRR, disaster risk reduction options. We use the ecosystem-based called nature-based solutions now approaches to help us reduce the disaster risk and adapt to climate change. At the same time, we also use these approaches to create sustainable livelihood opportunities while conserving the natural resource base. The OECS recognizes that ecosystem-based interventions can address socioeconomic challenges, but that the improper use of these can harm biodiversity and communities. Therefore, nature-based solutions must be implemented in a manner to ensure that we optimize the use of these ecosystems and minute, minimize the negative impacts on the resource users, the communities and the environment. And I say that because sometimes when we apply uh, what we consider an ecosystem-based intervention, it may impact livelihoods negatively. Some persons figure that they no longer have these livelihoods but at the same time, we, so we want to ensure that it's not to the detriment of either the resource unit users or the ecosystem. For us, the opportunities, we believe at the OECS that nature-based solutions approach can aid in ensuring optimal utilization of and sustainable management of ecosystems in the Caribbean. We also believe that the Global NBS standard is an avenue to measure and ensure the credibility of nature-based solutions, as well as its adoption for adaptive management and to use nature-based solutions contributions to inspire other entities, other interventions beyond the environment and the conservation sectors. Nature-based standard, uh, that global standard can be viewed as a critical tool to ensuring that nature-based solutions do not create negative socioeconomic impacts for the stakeholders, and we say in all stakeholders. And as such, the OECS Commission therefore supports its utilization. The potential for the application of the standard in the implementation and monitoring of some of our key instruments, such as the St. George's Declaration, and particularly the new St. George's 2040, the Biodiversity and Ecosystems Management Framework and the Associated Strategic Action Plans, the Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy, or ECROP, and the Green Blue Economy Strategy. We also feel that the application of the standard could provide concrete challenge on the returns on investment in ecosystem conservation and the benefit to society and the economy. We also foresee some challenge. We recognize that not much focus is given to natural assets or natural capital accounting by the policymakers when developing national strategies and in decision making. How do we create this awareness among policymakers and civil society to ensure buy-in and application of the standard in the member states. For consideration at the time when I looked at this, we felt that gender equity and social inclusion, which we promote, and we have a toolkit on this, especially for climate change adaptation, we recommend that if it has not been done, that the standard should include the GASI parameters. And Dr. Emmanuel mentioned that in Criterion 5, I think she said, that has been done. So it remains to see if we are satisfied with the, these parameters and their inclusion. And lastly, the OECS will continue promoting nature-based solutions. And we are hoping to collaborate with the IUCN and other agencies to raise awareness of and educate key stakeholders in the application of the standard. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Norville. Um, I think it was really well done, you working to illustrate how useful the uh, nature-based solutions tool uh, can be to 
the region in helping to execute some of these really important initiatives and how it also connects to some of the, the conventions that were signed on to. So thank you so much for framing that up. Um, I invite you to continue to stay on the panel. Um, I am acknowledging that we have an additional panelist, Mr. Fernando Loveras. He's the chair of the Caribbean Regional Committee of IUCN members, and we are excited that he is joining us on the panel. Um, moving on to our next panelist, um, who we're challenging to respond to our question. Um, I am excited to introduce Honorable Pranal Charles Jr. He is the Minister of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change within the government of Jamaica. Minister Charles is an attorney at law with a qualifications practice law in both Jamaica and the United States of America. Throughout his professional career, he has served with distinction as a judicial clerk, senior clerk of court crown counsel at the office of the director of public prosecutions. Most recently, he served as the lead counsel and managing attorney of the law offices of Pernell P. Charles Jr. PA. Uh, we are excited that you are here and joining us the panel and we hand you the floor, Minister. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Very clearly. <laughs> well, I, I feel, I tell you, um, I have come to this position for the last three months since September. And listening to all of your panelists, I think I really should just be a spectator learning. I need to get my paper and, and, and my pad and pencil uh, because the presentations have been excellent. Um, I could pretty much just say ditto. Uh, but let me give you a little insight into what's happening here in Jamaica. We find the nature-based solutions to be a critical tool uh, for us as a government as it relates to the recovery, the green recovery post COVID-19. Um, the solutions are, are very important for small island uh, developing states, such as those in the Caribbean, particularly because as we've said, uh, we have extreme vulnerability to external shocks. And so we need to increase our resilience to the impact of natural disasters and climate change. Um, my ministry, uh, is a new ministry. It's the first time that we in Jamaica have put together this collaboration of four portfolio areas, housing, urban renewal, environment, and climate change. And so it is a renewed focus for us on sustainable development. You therefore understand how critical the discussion on nature-based solutions um, is to me and to my ministry, because uh, ecological resilience is a very instrumental part of what we are trying to advance and support in our country. Now, this year, we not only saw the pandemic, but uh, we have suffered from what has been the most active weather season. Um, Jamaica was impacted by four tropical weather systems. We had Laura, Delta, Zeta, Eta, um, and you note that we had to go into the Greek so that means that shows you how active the season had been. Uh, we were impacted with damage of the cost of more than $2 billion. And so the ability for our country to recover after the passage of these weather systems, um, coupled with the pandemic, in large part rest on ecological uh, resilience of the country. And so, uh, the, again, the discussion that we're having here today and the application of uh, the IUCN's global standard to the nature-based solutions will be very useful um, in making, in us making informed and strategic policy decisions in the country for us to build back better. Um, there are several examples of what we're doing. We have in Jamaica a 3 million trees in three years national planting initiative and that's being led by my ministry through the agency, which is our forestry department. And under this initiative, uh, we, as a government, we intend to plant with stakeholders, a variety of endemic um, native and uh, fruit trees, um, agroforestry in total, taking into account the appropriateness of the various sites um, and the need for us also to look on, uh, not just planting trees, but planting a particular type of tree for instance, we saw some landslides uh, where unfortunately two of our citizens were killed. 
Um, and when we did the assessment, you could see that if there was a particular type of vegetation to hold the soil together more, it would have minimized or perhaps even eliminated the possibility of, of those landslides. So uh, that tree planting initiative is, is critical for us. Another one, uh, moving quickly, um, is the payment of ecosystem schemes, um, which is in some, uh, some of the islands, watershed management areas. And <clears throat> where we have had classification of the watersheds as being severely degraded. Um, in addition to projects that showcase nature-based solutions as an important tool to our development. Um, it is important also that the nature-based solution is mainstream in all of our development process um, and policies, including those related to economic growth and development and social well-being. Um, so again, I think that uh, the IUCN global standard for nature-based solutions can certainly assist in that process of expanding the reach and integrating um, the, the solutions into the mainstream of our development processes for the Caribbean. Uh, the, the global standard can provide governments with another opportunity um, and very important for us to review, for us to evaluate the past experiences and to learn, to learn from it so that we use the benchmarks as an important platform for us to, to springboard and get things right when addressing the sustainable use of our fragile and finite natural assets. Um, you know, one of the things that I always say, the Caribbean is such a blessed region. Um, our countries are beautiful, uh, but at the same time, we are so vulnerable um, so we have advantages and disadvantages that flow from our unique characteristics. That means that we have to spend more time, uh, more energy and more money um, applying the, the, the best practice to utilize um, our, our assets, our natural assets. In Jamaica, uh, we are exploring the feasibility of listing a green bond on the stock market. Um, and this would be another opportunity to further mainstream the application of the global standard for nature-based solutions um, as it relates to the listed climate smart and sustainable investments. And we would try to, to raise awareness and encourage um, the investors uh, to, to get involved um, in these types of, of projects. Of course, uh, with any standard, whether it is international or local, there'll be need for capacity building of the users, including uh, policymakers like myself and regulators, um, as well as sensitizing the public, the stakeholders who will interact with this. Um, and we, we are advancing that here in Jamaica. We have some way to go, um, but the Caribbean on a whole has to see raising public awareness and getting a, a higher standard of capacity building as critical. That's why this, even this session that we're doing now is so very important. Um, it is also anticipated that the IUCN global standard uh, for nature-based solutions will not remain static, but evolve over time with increased access to an availability of scientific and traditional knowledge. So we hope that this, the information that we uh, gather and what we learn causes us to mature with time in how we use our, um, our assets and create the resilience that should flow from nature-based solutions. So we want the standards uh, to, to, be, to be high, to be flexible um, and applied uh, where necessary using the, the accurate information. Empirical data must drive uh, our policies. It must drive uh, the creation of standards. Um, and so pilot testing is going to be very important and we've been doing so um, here in Jamaica as well. Also, um, in closing, the global standard for it to be applied adequately locally, the standard therefore has to be considered and adopted by our region. It has to be a regional and national standard setting bodies that, that examine these issues. Um, and it's therefore important 
that the authorities um, are brought fully on board in promoting and implementing uh, the standards that will guide how the country uh, views these things and how we use um, our, our own assets to develop solutions. We see further development and use of the global standards for nature-based solutions as uh, bringing together collaboration and partnership among uh, the various stakeholders, including civil society, which we have a, a very vocal uh, groups here um, in the Caribbean and, and, and in Jamaica in particular, um, and including academia, because we have uh, several uh, professionals, um, very, uh, very good technocrats and experts um, in the Caribbean who can work together with other stakeholders for us to realize the societal benefits at all levels. I mean, a transparent, accountable, um, and I would dare say equitable manner. Um, and the issue of equity, and I'll, I'll rest it here because of time, equity in how we apply standards and how we develop solutions and use those solutions in our country will be very important um, because the, it is our responsibility as leaders to make sure uh, that in all the policies and how we implement them, equity guides our delivery. So I look forward to uh, the discussion. I look forward to the use of the standards and to the nature-based solutions um, and its use here nationally and regionally. And I thank you so much for considering me fit uh, to participate with all of the distinguished panelists today. Thank you so much. Minister Charles, thank you. I think you did an excellent job <laughs> into putting into perspective the importance of the standards in policy decision development here in the Caribbean as we try to transition to a more climate resilient um, uh, region and as we also transition towards sustainable development. So I invite you to please stay on um, on the panel. I uh, just want to yeah. remind everyone that we will have a question and answer session following this panel. So please, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please use the Q&A tool, uh, not the chat tool, but the Q&A tool to post your questions. We will be sharing the questions with the panelists following uh, uh, their responses. Um, thanks again, uh, Minister Charles. Um, I now invite uh, Mr. Fernando Loveris uh, San Miguel uh, to uh, give his response to the, the, the guiding question for the panel. Uh, Mr. Loveras has led the Conservation Trust of Puerto Rico in the past 17 years. Uh, the trust works to manage and protect Puerto Rico's natural areas. Since 2012, Mr. Loveras has also served as the president of Para La Naturaleza, a unit of the trust. In these roles, Mr. Loveras has grown the relevance and success of land conservation across Puerto Rico, taking a community first approach to his work and helping to provide essential services during hurricane recoveries. He currently holds the position of the chair of the Caribbean Regional Committee of IUCN members. We are excited to have you as part of the panel, Mr. Loveris, and I give you the floor. Thank you, thank you so much, Safiya. Uh, Gretel, uh, thank you for, for uh, helping us putting this together and uh, please thanks all the ORMAC uh, staff for this. And thank you for, to all the panelists. Uh, for, for being here uh, with us. Uh, in, on behalf of the uh, uh, Caribbean um, Regional Committee, uh, I wanna thank all, all the members that are uh, participating. And um, yeah, I would like to start by very briefly recognizing the importance of MBS. Um, um, I work in, in the policy arena uh, for quite a while and this type of uh, uh, platform or framework uh, is extremely useful. Um, it just brings a, a unified methodology for us all, and a, a more important than that, a unified language uh, uh, to take action and also to communicate results. So, so it, I think it is a great initiative from the IUCN, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to the uh, implementation and to, to keep polishing and, and, and growing this type of initiative. Uh, there are two key things that um, uh, will, will take us uh, down the road with this. Uh, one is how to incorporate this type of uh, standards into the public policy decisions, uh, especially like in Puerto Rico uh, and the US Virgin Islands, where we follow 
um, environmental um, uh, guidelines of the US federal government, uh, how the, this will interact with the um, environmental impact statements or environmental assessments, which are the tools that uh, the government used for, for their decision-making process. Uh, and also on the private side, how this uh, type of standards will be incorporated into what's uh, become a, a, a corporate initiative the, called the ESG, Environmental, Social and Governance uh, programs uh, of major corporations. So it, it will be interesting and, and uh, uh, hope the U IUCN also targets uh, these two major integrations into, into public policy and into the private uh, corporate realm. Um, Having said that, the implementation of these uh, standards in the Caribbean will be uh, quite interesting and quite challenging. Uh, I think the Caribbean, as we all know, has very uh, unique characteristics. Uh, just starting with the governance, uh, we have uh, quite a, a challenging governance uh, structures, uh, very diverse. Uh, most of our economies are highly dependent on external players. Uh, so we, we have to be careful when we, we talked about uh, stakeholders because uh, I think we need to make sure that the uh, we we make sure that the critical and primary stakeholders are local communities, uh, and that should have a weight. So when when I, I read uh, in the standards uh, the word balance, uh, I would like just to point out how we're going to be defining balance uh, uh, when when we're not in a in a balanced system. So we need to we need to work on that in our in our arena. Uh, the climate change challenges, we all know, we don't have to repeat them. Um, uh, we, we have pretty much all of the high risk uh, activities uh, here from hurricane, earthquakes, volcanoes, droughts, flo flooding, sea level rise, uh, you name it, and, and we have it. So, so a lot of climate change uh, challenges that need to be addressed by the standards. Uh, the, our dependence on the blue economy and, and the fact that we need to make it uh, sustainable, or, or, as was said before, regenerative, uh, and the rest of the uh, items that um, uh, are shared worldwide, the food and water security, biodiversity loss, protecting genetic assets, uh, moving to clean energy and controlling ocean waves, and of course, the human health and equity and the poverty. So the, these are all challenges that we face very deeply in the Caribbean, and all these standards have, are going to be uh, really um, uh, need to be incorporated into, into this methodology. Uh, just very quickly, in terms of para la naturaleza uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, as uh, we are in the, still in the process of the recovery uh, from FEMA, I just want to use this as an example, uh, because uh, billions of dollars have been assigned for the recovery of Puerto Rico by FEMA. Uh, and a lot of this funding has been controlled or are being controlled by external uh, uh, co corporations that have no relationship whatsoever in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's, it's part of this uh, 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 crisis um, uh, economy uh, that's going on. Um, and it's, uh, it's just something I'm pretty sure none, none of uh, our current recovery projects uh, uh, will, will be able to uh, comply with um, uh, NBS standards at all. So we need to, uh, that's one of our, uh, perhaps our challenge to, to see how we can take FEMA and the, and the local government to understand the importance of all these eight uh, principles. Um, we are in a, in a process and we have been for, for quite a while of really pushing forward to protecting 33% of our land uh, and 33% of our oceans uh, arena. Uh, so that's, um, that's, that's a challenge that, that we have. We started in 8% in uh, 2000, uh, where we have been able to double it, but we need to double it again. So, so that's something that we need to address uh, with this new uh, framework. We are also uh, uh, following the steps of uh, Jamaica here with the minister. Uh, we're, we have a big reforestation program going on. Uh, we have a 1 million trees goal going through, and we have about 50 of our staff dedicating full time to this work. Um, hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll get it uh, going with a lot of volunteers. So that's another project that will be assessed uh, under the standards. We have a very strong community-based pro uh, conservation project uh, called Acompaña. Uh, we, we, we have been working with 33 communities after the hurricane. We have been able to fund uh, fundraise and, and, and fund the uh, solar panels and water capture and filtration system in all of the, in all of these 33 community centers, and um, we're just taking that to another level of really um, 
uh, working a specific project with this uh, um, uh, communities. Uh, we started with four this year, we, we're gonna go up to eight next year. So that's another project that we have been uh, really, it has been transforming our conservation work because we're, we have a, an incredible partnership with these communities that we never had before. Um, agroecology, food security, we are also um, be able to work with uh, about 150 um, agroecological farmers after the hurricane, and we keep going strong on that. Uh, we have been able to get some funding uh, from, from Rotary Club, uh, uh, which has been extremely supportive. Um, and and it's, it's been a, an amazing work in terms of supporting that industry, especially uh, with the losses that we suffered. Um, and uh, in terms of beach erosion, it's part of our reforestation. We're doing a lot of uh, dune restoration project as well and mangrove restoration project, uh, hopefully uh, funded by FEMA eventually, but um, so far uh, the ones we're doing, we're, we're funding it ourselves. So uh, just to sum up, uh, uh, I think these, uh, these uh, uh, standards are, are very uh, will be very important going into the future. We'll be looking, uh, uh, Gretel with Orma, how we can uh, start working on pilot projects and see how we can uh, establish the assessment of those for some of our projects. And I encourage all of the other Caribbean members uh, uh, to join us and, and see if you have any projects you would like to um, run through uh, with the assessment. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get uh, uh, the needed uh, capacity building from IUCN uh, to, to really take this into the ground. So thank you so much uh, for, for this initiative. Thank you so much, Mr. Loveras, for concisely uh, sharing with us examples and ways in which Puerto Rico can apply the standards to ongoing as well as new projects with a focus on conservation and protection, especially as Puerto Rico and some of the other islands in the Caribbean continue to recover from the impacts of uh, prior hurricanes. Um, I, I also invite you to stay on the panel as um, we will be doing a question and answer session um, once all panelists have had an opportunity to respond. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> I am happy to uh, present our, our next panelist, uh, Mr. Jabanex Batista. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, where he oversees operations and development of new initiatives. Uh, he has over 20 years of experience and has focused his career on international financing institutions and sustainable financing for both conservation and development. Um, this includes working with governments on policy development, as well as uh, working on multilateral environmental agreements. He has extensive experience in environmental negotiations and in the establishment of conservation trust funds and other financial mechanisms. Um, I am very fortunate to work very closely with Jabinex uh, and his colleagues at the CBF on some of the work um, that I've been involved in in the Caribbean and I'm really happy to see him as part of the panel. Jabba, I pass the floor on to you. Thank you so much, Sophia, and good morning, um, good afternoon, everyone, depending on, on where you are or, or good evening. Um, first, I would like to make sure that, that everyone is, is seeing my screen without a problem. Um, Sophia, could you let me know? I can see it. Great, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank um, all the organizers and particularly the team from IUCN for the kind invitation to be with you today. It is uh, indeed a very exciting and important topic for all of us to, to be discussing in, in our region. Um, Nature-based solutions are, are really a key solution for the future of our region in this world where we have to tackle a biodiversity crisis, a climate change crisis, an economic crisis, and a health crisis. And nature-based solutions are at the center of helping us address all of those. Before I go on the question that Sophia posed um, to all of us in the panel, I would like to tell you first just a little bit about what is the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund and uh, what is the Caribbean Sustainable Finance Architecture. We at the CBF, we are what it's called a conservation trust fund. And conservation trust funds main mission is to mobilize resources for the conservation and sustainable agenda. And that is, that is exactly what we do at the CBF. Our specific 
vision is to see a Caribbean region where both the people and nature thrive. And our specific contribution to this is exactly that that I said before, mobilizing financial resources for making sure that that vision becomes a reality. The CBF, together with a set of national conservation trust funds, form what we call the Caribbean Sustainable Finance Architecture. This architecture started to be built um, more formally after 2012, but um, initially in its conceptual stage started to be built um, starting in 2008. What you see on screen is a very brief description of how the architecture looks like right now. To the far left, you see a set of donors that are providing funding today to the two main instruments of the CBF, an endowment fund that focuses on um, conservation actions, mainly on protected areas and effective management of biodiversity within and outside of protected areas. Through this instrument, we have uh, uh, primary partners in the countries where we work, which are the National Conservation Trust Funds, and we channel resources to these trust funds who then in turn lead the grant making programs at the national level and fund the national level projects or sub-national level projects with governments, NGOs, CBOs, academic research institutions being the implementing agencies of those projects. Under that aspect of our work, we also work with our partner trust funds to continue to build additional financial mechanisms to increase the funding directed to the environmental needs in the countries that we work. That is represented by the red circle that you see on screen. At the same time, we have another instrument right now that it's called the Ecosystem Based Adaptation Facility. This instrument anchors our climate change program and it's an instrument that we uh, manage directly. This instrument right now is a sinking fund and it's on its second call for proposals. We're already financing um, 11 projects throughout the region. Some of them are regional and, and most of them being national. And now when we conclude the second call, we, we hope to be financing another set of region uh, projects, apologies, that will be tackling the adaptation needs throughout the Caribbean. We're also working on building a third instrument right now on the circular economy and in the next stage, creating new partnerships to support um, sub-regional sub-regional organizations throughout the Caribbean. Why do I mention all of this? Because for us, the standard that IUCN has developed for nature-based solutions is extremely important in two ways. The first one, as I was reading first the, the standard in, in the original launch of IUCN done at the global level, I, I realized that we at the CBF have been working already on promoting nature-based solutions. That's part of our mission. That's part of what we do. But this standard is really going to give us, and it's already given us a key tool for us to better define how we direct resources to those on the ground and in the water projects that we are financing. It helps us define better what we need to measure in terms of expected results, how we go about it, and it's going to have a much better framework and plan for our strategic process to define those investments that we want to see throughout the region. So for us at the CBF, that is extremely useful as a, as a donor institution, as a financing institution for conservation, particularly at the current stage where we are, where we are going to start developing our new strategic plan um, for the next five years. So thank you so much to IUCN um, because your, your standards come at a very great time for us at the CBF. Second, this standard for us, it's, it's also important because I, I was listening to, to the minister and to Fernando um, talk before about the initiatives related to policy actions and, and, and actions on the ground. And for us, this standard is also very important because we need to also focus our mission and our actions on ensuring that not only we have nature-based solutions um, in the Caribbean, but we also need to come um, bring together those nature-based solutions with sustainable financing solutions so that we make sure 
that then those actions that are nature-based will last into the future. If we don't continue to work together with governments, with the actors on the ground, with the um, regional organizations like OECS, and with institutions like the CBF and others in the region that, that dedicate part of their mission to sustainable financing, we're not gonna make nature-based solutions sustainable. So we need to make sure that those policy directions that come from governments and sub-regional organizations that um, practice those lessons learned from on the ground experiences and the sustainable financing solutions are brought together to make sure that nature-based solutions are successful throughout the region. So thank you so much, um, Sophia and everyone for, for the kind invitation again and the opportunity to share our perspective on the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Java, for sharing on the work of the, the, the important work of the CBF and also for using your time to stress the importance of connecting nature-based solutions, the approaches to nature-based solutions to sustainable financing. Because without financing, we can talk and decide as much on what the approaches could look like, but um, they would never be implemented. So it's just really important that we look into developing sustainable financing tools to support some of these innovative approaches. Thank you so much, Jabba. I also invite you to stay on uh, for the question and answer session. I would like to invite our final panelist, uh, Mrs. Carolyn Trubetskoy. Uh, she is the executive director, marketing and the executive director and marketing and operations uh, director of Anne's Chastenay and Jade Mountain Resorts in Soufre, Saint Lucia. She's also the president of the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association and has been an active member of the marketing committees of the St. Lucia Tours Board for the past 20 years. Callan was appointed president of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association in 2016 uh, for the 2016 to 2018 term and was the second woman to serve as president of the association in its 50 year history. In January 2019, she was appointed envoy to the Caribbean Challenge Initiative to bring awareness and build resilience of marine and coastal resources in the Caribbean. She's also the honorary counsel of the Federal Republic of Germany uh, to St. Lucia and a citizen of St. Lucia. In May 21st, 2019, the Federal Republic of Germany bestowed Carolyn the Order of Merit to acknowledge her work as honorary counsel and her volunteer leadership in St. Lucia and the Caribbean to promote sustainable operations, uh, building resilience and mitigate, mitigating efforts, uh, mitigating effects of climate change. We are very happy that Carolyn is joining us today uh, to talk about the, the perspective of private sector. Carolyn, I uh, give you the floor. Thank you very much, Sophia. And, um... Thank you for inviting me to this um, very interesting and informative panel. I agreed to be on the panel before I saw the questions of Sophia, which, which is a mouthful, and I wanted to run away. And like Minister Charles, I feel now I should be a spectator, spectator rather than a presenter. But nevertheless, let me, let me talk to you about tourism and uh, what paradigm shifts need to occur to introduce and implement these standards of nature-based um, solutions. Um, talking about tourism, um, as we know, we live in one of the most tourism-dependent regions in the world. Pre-COVID, the uh, Caribbean saw over 30 million stay of over visitors and over 30 million uh, cruise visitors. Um, whilst we only have approximately 44 million um, people living in the Caribbean region, which is over 1 million square miles. In as much we are the most important and the economic driver for the region, we are sadly also, of course, the economy that has a det detrimental effect on our nature. Um, whether it is uh, co uh, contributing to marine pollution and degradation, whether it is um, putting stress on our natural resources, and whether it is related to the high demand that the industry has for, for water and, and energy. Having said all that, I want to also now say where we are now in this COVID environment. Clearly, COVID has given us 
pause to 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 look at the environment look at the industry and and ask us where will we go with this i think the paradigm shift that we need to see uh for the tourism industry and remember i speak now to the nature-based solutions within tourism the, the paradigm shift is that we we really recognize our fragility and when i say that is look how fragile we as humans have been in in this COVID environment and we must finally recognize that our natural environment is also extremely fragile and that we have a tremendous responsibility to to ensure that we can preserve that we can mitigate the effects of climate change that we can um, you know assist in in, the, in, in um, keeping up biodiversity and of course also very important for the industry to uh, also help with um, the the topic of food security now when we look at the tourism industry um, generally the areas where standards for nature-based solutions um, play very heavily for us is of course in the areas of, of introduction of renewable energy, how we deal with water and wastewater, issues that are related to plastic reduction, food security, but also food waste is really uh, two, imp uh, two important topics for us in tourism. And also um, how we deal with our um, marine environment, how we uh, assist with uh, the issue of coral restoration and also protecting uh, of mangroves. Um, I think that um, one of the other paradigm shifts that have occurred is that we are going to see a different type of traveler in the future. Um, I think that not only are we as, as as hotel operators, as tourism operators, as destinations, not only are we expected to, to provide and develop a very responsible tourism product, much more responsible travelers, meaning that um, they want to also go somewhere where they feel that the environment has been preserved, where the industry has made an effort to to in fact implement nature-based solutions now um when i um as a you know as a private citizen or like as a as a hotel operator and I always like to joke i mean in the end of the day we're all innkeepers you know when i'm in this panel of academics and scientists i always think that what's so important is to to break down what we are discussing here into small bite-sized units because I often get the feeling in tourism that um, operators think, well, you know, the, the problems are so large, I can't make a difference. But you know that this is not the case. Everybody has to play a role and everybody has to take some of these responsibilities on. So for, for us in tourism and knowing how important a healthy environment is for the industry, um, it is really the advocacy and the education of our own team members, first of all, and our own managers to respect and understand what standards of nature-based solutions represent. As you know, there is quite a number of uh, hospitality, external uh, environmental accreditation um, organizations. I'm talking about LEED, Travel Life, or Green Globe that many people know. Um, it would be very good to really um, look at um, the standards and uh, um, look at how the accreditation is, is performed and incorporated. That would be very, uh, regionally, I'm very pleased to say that from the time I was president of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association, we were able to re-energize um, uh, an entity called the Caribbean Alliance for Sustainable Tourism. And that would also be a very important body in future to be in touch with, to ensure that they also fulfill um, their mandate to, um, to educate and advocate for a more integration of these nature-based solutions. From a, from a national perspective um, and possibly also regionally, um, 
the um, the environmental impact assessments for developers in tourism should obviously also incorporate nature-based solutions and standards of that nature and uh, ensure that developers um, when they submit their plans also uh, include a plan how they plan to preserve and incorporate the nature surrounding them now um, speaking um, and I always have to stress when I speak tourism, I want to have a resort that not only turned out to be carbon neutral, but now it's like carbon, carbon negative. But I mean, again, here, for example, what was really important is that the re regulatory framework um, that allowed them to um, the regulatory framework was there that allowed them to, for example, introduce a lot of renewable energy. In many other places, um, we are hindered to go that extra step. Uh, so there is definitely a need for a collaboration between private and public sector to ensure that The regulations allow us to introduce more to the grid for it. Um, at our own properties, I'm pleased to say water reservoir from the 70, from the 18th century, which can hold two and a half million gallon waters, and we were able water, and we were able to um, um, incorporate that in our operations so that we are completely water independent. Uh, and are not taking uh, water away from our communities. And also we uh, have created a wonderful system for our wastewater um, that goes through a, a, a system of reed beds. All in all, um, there is, it's a no brainer that tourism has to embrace these standards for not nature-based um, solutions. Um, I think that um, we have made a start, but we now need to take it further and we need to get the message across that no matter how big or small your enterprise is, you play a part. And I know the time is running out, so I will leave it at that, Sophia. Thank you. Carolyn, thanks so much. And congratulations for taking on the daunting task of responding to this question uh, from a private sector perspective and offering, I think, some great food for thought for participants, which I think and it actually will stimulate um, some good discussion in the Q&A session. So please stay with us. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, so we have uh, our panelists have given us um, all really great responses and I know we've gotten some questions in. We have about 10 minutes uh, for questions. So I'm just gonna dive right in. Um, the first question is addressed to both uh, Mrs. Norville and to Minister Charles. Um, you both mentioned the importance of ensuring national and regional application of the NBS tool. Can you share more on how you envision the inclusion of this tool into regional responses and approaches using nature-based solutions uh, toward economic development as well as economic recovery? Should I shoot at it first? Absolutely, Minister. <laughs> um, you know, I think for us, it's, it's, it's really no, no option. We have to start finding a way to best evaluate um, maximizing the potential of our assets. Um, and the tool will guide us in looking on how best to make investments and how to, um, and all the variables that are required um, in making sense of, of, of using what God has given us um, to build up our ecological resilience um, along the train of development which is required for us in the Caribbean. Um, as I said in the presentation, um, you know, for some time now, uh, decisions have been made based on what people feel. Um, and it is important for us to transition to a, a place where our policies, 
um, our developmental process is uh, guided by these tools um, and the empirical um, data and adequate information so that the outcome uh, will be uh, sustainable. As, as I said for my ministry, you know, um, everything we do now has to be based on that platform and with that commonality. So that, that's my contribution to the, to the answer. Okay, just to add to what the minister said, um, for us, we have a lot of policies, we you know a lot of instruments and these things, but what we also have is a lot of community-based interventions. And most of our stakeholders, our key st stakeholders are the communities and the resource users. There are times where there are projects and we try to do on the ground tangible projects, but in doing these, even the selection of the projects for us is very important. So apart from the top down in terms of the policy, but also the bottom up, we need to ensure that when we apply a nature-based solution or option that these, the communities are what should I call them? They are our mouthpiece, our word of mouth. They have to see the benefit. So we, we have to ensure that when we apply these options that they can see the benefit and they can continue to pass on, they can testify to that. So for us having these standards or that, that global standard would help us to monitor it would also help us to provide the evidence required to show to the policymakers as well as the communities or the, um, the community stakeholders that this NBS worked. It worked here, we can apply it elsewhere. And I think that makes great sense in terms of accountability, especially when it comes to financing and, and helping to secure financial resources to meet some of those goals. Minister, there is another question here for you. Um, for promoting NBS over alternative solutions or even no action, what sort of justification from your technical staff would you be looking for? How can we better mainstream the use of NBS, especially for, especially by private sector? Well, I think, um, you know, ultimately as a government, we're here to protect our people and advance the development of the country. And so, in everything, we want to make sure that the decisions we are making um, have their basis um, in arising from adequate evaluation. So I would expect that the technocrats would present to me as a minister um, the, again, the, the scientific basis. There has to be some amount of, of, um, of testing, of um, examination, perhaps a comparative analysis of what has taken place in other jurisdictions, what has failed, what has worked, um, and how that will be applied in our locale, in our jurisdiction here. Um, I am accountable to the people. And so uh, we would have to ensure that in the governance structure, um, we are getting the sufficient um, and adequate evidence to say to people, listen, Choose, choose this over that. Um, and sometimes these, these solutions will be more costly in the beginning. Um, and so we'll have to show that over time, in the long term, um, the vision is truly for us to create a, a pathway towards sustainable development. Um, and, and I'm sure that that we have a lot of experience to lean on, as, as Dr. said, in relation to the community-based, a lot of pilot programs will have to be run um, for us to justify and, and try things out. Um, and we do that here in Jamaica. Um, and I think that that's, that's the only way forward for us. Pilot programs, examine it, and then we as ministers move forward the policy. Thank you, Minister. This next question, um, could, can be answered by actually both Carolyn and Ms. Oliveras. So the question reads, how can NBS standards be passed to and attract visitors, users, tourists, and tour operators with the audience not necessarily knowing what the standards are and know the NBS, sorry, let me, let me start over. 
How can NBS standards be passed to and attract visitors, users, tourists, and tour operators when the audience does not necessarily know that the MBS standards that environmentally responsible private and public organizations are, implement, are implemented. So in the case where the audience or the, the public are unaware on what the environmentally responsible standards are, how can you pass, how can they be passed to attract visitors, users, tourists, and tour operators? I hope I've captured that. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, from from my point of view, it should be it, it will it will come over time that they will start understanding uh, at least the general benefits of of these types of uh, of uh, compliance with with the standards. Uh, so, so I think this this uh, is a good point that that this could should be accompanied with uh, a communication strategy. Um, that uh, forces or, or that benefits, uh, for instance, hotels or tour operators uh, that comply with with uh, this type of standards uh, to um, you know to to help them uh, in terms of their their um, economic uh, you know the clients. So so in general, I think it could benefit uh, the the operators and the and the hotels. Uh, that will will comply or have pro projects that that have been in compliance with the standards. I think over time, it's a, it's just a matter of communicating it. Thank you, Mr. Lawyer Vera. Uh, Carolyn. Yeah. No. Uh, and I think we we have already seen that that two operators are in fact very proactively asking these questions, and and so I think that um, as you have said, uh, um, uh, Minister Lovera the um you no you're the chair of the caribbean regional committee sorry um you, we need to do more work on the communication on them if you are able to incorporate the standards in the already existing accreditation um, um organizations i think you will see uh, uh, more adaptation to these standards as we go along. I mean, there is some um, interesting opportunities now. There is a new website, Vege. It's Creole for Voyage, W A J. I have to put it in the in a chat room. But this is an opportunity for uh, Caribbean tourism businesses and hotels to to uh, um, select a a carbon offset project and and when a guest books a hotel on this platform they can make a contribution towards this project now as i'm also the chairperson of the St. Lucia national conservation fund it gives me now an opportunity to um, work with the national conservation fund and try to create a project that would then benefit um basically and, and create a, a um, you know something health uh, a project for the environment yet i also have now done this this advocacy and education of the visitor by this combination by having it on the website called Vajay. i'm putting it in the chat box so everybody can say the website i'm speaking about thanks so much carolyn uh and our very final question in this session goes to jabba uh the question is in relation to the biodiversity fund are there any examples of marine-based projects that have benefited from this mechanism? Yes, thank you, Sophia, and thank you for, for the question. Um, yes, actually, most of our projects are focused on the marine and coastal environment. So when the CBF and all the National Conservation Trust Funds that we partnered with were created, we all knew that the big vacuum was in the marine and coastal realm. But our institutions are designed to fund um, projects in both the terrestrial and marine ecosystems. But, but by large, um, most of the funding is going to, to marine and coastal actions. For example, in our EBA facility, in fact, that EBA facility focused on ecosystem-based adaptation, all of our interventions have to be marine and coastal. Um, and, and that's part of the design of that um, facility. On the conservation finance side program, which is the one anchored by our endowment, um, our partner conservation trust funds that have already received um, resources from the CBF are already doing their call for proposals and implementing actions. We have supported Fondo Marena in the Dominican Republic um, to finance uh, marine conservation actions in Estero Hondo which is in the northern part of the region. Another example is with our colleagues from the St. Vincent 
Conservation, um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines Conservation Fund, who are using some of our resources to finance actions in the Tobago Keys National Park. So um, by large, our focus is marine. And when we introduce our new circular economy facility, the focus of that will also be um, on marine issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jabba. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists today uh, for participating in this uh, uh, panel. I thought the dialogue was very informative and exciting. Um, and so thank you, uh, Honorable Minister Charles. Thank you, Mrs. Norville. Thank you, Mr. Luveris. Thank you, both Jabba and Carolyn. Thank you to all the participants that uh, joined us today. Um, we're very happy that we stuck to the time. <laughs> Thank you all for being very concise. Um, so I know there's been a lot of activity on the chat group um, and there's been a sort of exchange and of, of information. Please continue with this. So I am now going to transition into closing this webinar. I'd like to thank the organizers of the webinar, uh, IUCN, the Commission on Ecosystem Management, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the OECS Commission, as well as my colleagues at the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. And in closing, if I can borrow some of the words um, from Mr. Loveras, we know that uh, in applying the MBS tool, it will be a very interesting and challenging process. Um, so friends, thank you for joining us today um, for additional information uh, on this session, uh, presentations and videos. Uh, please refer to the ICN website. I know that the organizers will be sharing um, in a note following the close of the webinar some additional information with you. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, before I close, I'd like to recognize Dr. Bethel Aguilar Rojas, uh, Honorable Herod uh, Stanislaus uh, of St. Lucia, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Cohen Shasham, and Mrs. Hyacinth Armstrong Vaughan. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Ciao. Thank you. All the best. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Gracias. Thank you very much.